<laughs> oh, are we already on? Okay. We are on. Okay. All right. I guess uh, I should start on the whiteboard then, since we're already there. Okay. Let's see. Is this uh? I'll follow. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So uh, today. The topic is the effective topos. So this is going to be a topos which takes, uh, which has as its set of truth values uh, sets of realizers. So uh, this is building off of like cleaning realizability and so on, different kinds of realizability that we've talked about before. Um, so I'll go over that in a second, but uh, just to get the history out first, I think that this starts something like 1979 uh, with Martin Highland lecturing on the effective topos. So I don't get any papers yet, but then after that we have in 1980 Highland Johnstone Pitts tripos theory. So uh, it turns out that effective toposes arise by a certain construction, which you can factor into two constructions, and the thing in the middle is a tripos. So um, before we actually see any papers on the effective topos, we get this uh, paper on tripos theory, and also 1981, uh, Pitts publishes a PhD thesis on tripos theory. And then finally, in 1982, Island publishes the effective topos. So, a paper, the effective topos on the effective topos. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the effective topos. I might mention triposes at the end, but I'm mostly not going to mention it. Um, but so, the basic idea here is we have this topos F. Topos and the objects are going to be something like sets modulo equivalence relations. I'll sort of revise what I'm saying here in a second. And morphisms are going to be functional relations. And so these equivalence relations and functional relations are going to be defined in some logic. And what makes this the effective topos is that the truth values in that logic are sets of realizers. So an equivalence relation is not just going to say uh, two things are equal or two things are not equal. It will say, here are the uh, set, here's the set of realizers that says that these two things are equal. Okay. So just to review now, go back to realizability. I'm going to say, call this thing sigma, the power set. Natural numbers. So these are the truth values. Uh, a truth value is going to be a set of realizers, and those realizers are natural numbers. Okay. So a formula um, in some variables x is interpreted as a uh, function from x into the set of truth values, all right? And now the logical operations on these things. So phi is the set of phi x, where x is an x. So as x ranges over some variables. And now, for example, the set of realizers for phi and psi is going to be pairs of natural numbers. So a realizer for this conjunction is going to be a pair of realizers where m is a realizer for phi and n is a realizer. Okay. So this is a, the pairing function of natural numbers, which is going to take two seconds. Yeah? Uh, so I'm a little confused by the notation of the uh, the the bottom second line is it the uh, the family uh, labeled tuple or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's the function from x to the set of truth values. Okay. All right. 
And then for a destruction, it's going to be either tagged with zero and I realize it for five, or tag with one, I realize it for sign. For functions, we'll have sets of a set of indices that code for a function which take realize which takes realizers of phi to realizers of size. So this E if given a realizer for phi will converge and what it produces will be a realizer of psi. And then of course there are no realizers for bottom, and anything is realized for top. Okay, now we also have quantifiers. So, first of all, we can define substitution. We have some function from x to y, and by precomposition, we get substitution taking formulas in y to formulas in x, and then the quantifiers will be respectively left and right adjoint to the substitution. So exists is left adjoint to substitution, or exists sub f. So this will be exists f, just say exists f. Exists f dot phi will be So this is if uh, f here from x to y, then exists f phi is going to be a um, formula over y. And the set of realizers are sets of realizers for phi over x, so phi is formula over x, but where f of x equals y. So in particular, if f is a projection, this is just saying that there is there exists some um, things such as this. And then the for all f right adjoint. Okay. Now, just a, a side note. Um, the properties of natural numbers that are used here are basically um, the fact that it's uh, you can sort of embed universal computation in it by indices. Uh, so you can like implement pairing in the uptight lambda calculus. So that's not like an essential thing, but the essential thing is that you can encode functions. So you can really do this with say um, the untyped lambda calculus as your sets of untyped lambda terms as your as your truth values or any partial combinatory algebra is the, the thing that people use. So like if you know the, the SK calculus, it's one example. And so um, any partial combinatory algebra will give rise to a tripos, which is called then a realizability tripos. And any realizability tripos gives you a realizability topos, of which the effective topos is the one where you start with the natural numbers. OK. Yeah? So what happens on the variable case? Variable case? Um, is that the x itself or the singleton set of x? Well, so there are no variable formulas left. So this is, all right, so the, um, the interpretation of the formula is indexed by substitutions for variables. Um, I'm talking about x of x. x of x. Well, so it's it's the value of x. Okay. <laughs> it is already a subset. Right. Well, maybe I'm just confused by the type. Uh, whether it's a subset or the, the number. Right, you say sigma is a subset. Uh, right, but what's a, uh, what's a type of x? 
x is in set, right? Well, is that a number or is it But variables are not formulas. So this, the interpretation is defined on formulas. X, there's no x sub x because x is not a formula. Oh. So I haven't said anything about like atomic formulas here, but I'm not going to. <laughs> the atomic formulas will sort of be given with what they are uh, later on. But so now I can actually define the effective topos. Sort of described it before, but actual definition. As objects, we have um, x here is some set, equals here is a element of sigma to the x times x, which is to say a formula in two variables of type x. And it's required to satisfy, oh, I forgot something that I got to say over here. Shoot. All right, um, let's try it in the corner here. So I've defined all these things, but uh, one thing I'm missing is entailment. For um, <laughs> realizability, so we say that C entails psi, I entails psi, if there is a realizer for this implication for any variable substitution. So the fact that this is a intersection, so you, the realizers for this entailment have to be realizers for any uh, thing you plug into the variables that will be important later. Um, but in the meantime, that, so I'll say that some formula is valid if uh, it's entailed by true. Yeah. So if it has a realizer. OK, so then back over here. Stop putting this down and picking it up. OK. All right. So this uh, relation equals some formula. Uh, I'm assuming you gave this to me because red is bad. Yeah, I think it doesn't show very okay. well. <laughs> so let me just write over this here. Is that now readable or is it yeah. just a mess? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, it would be better from here on out. All right. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, we require that symmetry and and transitivity are valid for this relation. So um, when you have variables here, so the variables are going to be in some formula. And in this case, that formula is just defined by some subset here. So this is a slightly anatomic thing. And I'm basically <coughs> not going to distinguish between formulas as syntactic things and formulas as, as subsets of this from now on. So hopefully that isn't confusing. OK. Right. So and so L equals is a partial equivalence relation? Yes, it's a partial equivalence relation. Right. Um, and remember that the fact that these things are valid means that there is a non-empty set of realizers for them. So it's not just a statement, it's something with witnesses. OK. And I'm going to write dx to mean the formula x equals x. So that's going to hold for some things, not all, because as you observe, this is a partial equivalence relation. So that's our objects. Now, 
amorphisms <coughs> are going to be relations. So this is say amorphism um, G. Actually, equivalence classes of relations. And these relations are on x times y. And they have to be for one relational, meaning that gxy holds x is equal to x prime and y is equal to y prime, then g prime y prime holds. They have to be strict, meaning that if gxy holds, then x and y are both elements of the, their uh, respective sets according to the per and single valued. So now we're just getting into like functional relation territory. Well, we always were. <laughs> so g gives you y and g gives you y prime, then y should be equal to y prime. And finally, total. So if x is an x, then there exists y such that g. All right. And again, these have to be uh, valid, which means they're witnessed by realizers, and they're witnessed by realizers uniformly in variables. Now, one more thing to finish. I didn't mention what the uh, equivalence classes are. So just about what you would expect. Two function relations are equivalent if they give you the same results. So gxy if only if hxy. Okay. So now again this is an elementary topos. It is not a Grotten D topos, and this is part of the interest of the effective topos is that it is a topos which does not behave very much like a Grotten D topos. And the one thing I'm going to say about why this is true is just that the subobject classifier, as you could probably guess, is the set of truth values, the power set of the natural numbers. And the equivalence relation on it is by implication. So elements of this are sets of natural numbers. And then the um, set of realizers for P, if and only if Q, is just the set you know, built out of phi implies psi and psi implies phi. OK. Should I speak up or something? <laughs> I guess you wouldn't know. <laughs> Trying to optimize our chances. <laughs> OK. Uh, all right. So that's our definition. What have we gotten here? Let's name some things in the effective topos. I forgot to pay attention to the time. This is bad news. Stay there. All right. Now I've put definitions everywhere that I don't want to erase. That was bad news. All right. I'm not ready with this. I'm lost, I'm lost in the world. It's hard for me. OK. So first of all, here's a great way of uh, putting some things in the effective topos is that we have an inclusion. And there will be a topos inclusion. In the actually a topos inclusion sense. Um, but for now, let's just say we have a functor from sets into the effective topos. And so if x is a set, we sort of do the obvious thing. We get x comma, spell the x, where 
the set of realizers. So now I'm like writing semantic brackets as if I'm distinguishing between formulas and uh, sets of realizers, which are not really. But uh, Martin Hyland thought it was a good idea, so I'm going to go with it. So the set of realizers for x equals x prime is going to be uh, top, which is, remember, the whole set of natural numbers that these two things are equal, and bottom, which again is the empty set. OK, so that's a nice way of putting the set into the effective topos. And now the action on maps. So if we have a map of sets, f from x to y, then the, uh, the functional relation is going to be this one, uh, which is, so this is going to be a relation in x and y, and the realizers for a particular x and y are going to be well, It's just going to be top if f x equals y, and bottom otherwise. OK. So that's nice. And we'll come back to that later. Um, now, the terminal object in the effective topos is just so one. The effective topos is just delta one, so just a single object set, and this sort of trivial relation on it. <coughs> but, and uh, in general, it sort of plays nicely with limits, but we're going to have some problems when we start looking at co-limits. So 2 in the effective topos <coughs> is not delta 2. Here is y. So let's start with delta 2. So if we believe that delta 2 is 2, then, oh, I wanted to say more about 1 first. Shoot. Sorry. Pretend that you didn't hear this shocking surprise and prepare to be surprised by it later. OK, so just uh, go over what a map from this terminal object looks like. So a map from G to some uh, object in the effective topos. So this is going to be characterized by the set y such that g star y uh, is not empty. Because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually matter what realizes, what the, the set of realizers for this is, as long as it's not empty. Whatever it is, any two of these will be equivalent. You can just send, uh, you can just define a function from one to the other. No problem. OK. Um, and so this is equivalently an equivalence class of the relation y equals y prime is not empty. So this equivalence relation. OK. So then, now, shocking surprise, delta 2 is not 2, where by 2 I mean 1 plus 1. Um, and so if I want to convince you of that, what I have to say is that maps out of delta 2 are not pairs of equivalence classes like this. Okay? So what is a map from 2? So now I'm looking at 2 into something. All right, so now, if you'll recall from over here, we've got this totality condition. This y. This y. Gx y. So 
this, as I've, I've stressed a few times, is uniform in x and y. So we have a single realizer for this that works for all x and y. And um, remember, this is 0 equals 0. And by definition of delta, this is top, set of all natural numbers. So I'm saying, uh, suppose 2 is the set of 0 and 1 here. Set of realizing for 1 equals 1, or E1, also is top, also the natural numbers. So I've got this realizer. And now that should be a function from realizers of this to realizers of this. Now I can plug in any natural number, say I plug in 0, E0, and then that realizes exists y, gxy, um, for any x and y such that 0 is a realized difference. So E0, and now if I uh, pull out this existential, what this is going to say is I have a y0 and a y1 such that E0 applied to 0 realizes both g0, y0, and g1, y1. OK? And now, by combining the relational and single value requirements, I get, where am I? Just lost my place. There it is. OK, relational and single value. Gxy implies Gxy prime if and only if y equals y prime. Okay. And again, I have this one realizer, E0, for this, for both of these things. So if I plug in E0 here, I'll get a single realizer that realizes this uh, for both of these. And then if I pull it across the implication, what I find out is, well, implies this way, implies that, um, so here I'm plugging in y0, y1 equals y1. So in the end, what we get is a realizer for both y0 equals y0 and y1 equals y1. So these two have to intersect. And that's not in generally, uh, that's not in generally, uh, it's not in general going to be true for two particular uh, equivalence classes of this relation. Okay? So you can't just pick out two equivalence, uh, two equivalence classes of this and define a map from to this. Uh, define a map from Delta two. Sorry. Okay. So, what is two? Well, if you notice, the problem here is that we had the zero, which was a realizer for both zero equals zero and one equals one. So what we really want to do is make sure the set of realizers for these two things are separate. So a definition we can take is two is zero comma one, and this relation which has um, say n equals m where n and m can be zero and one is going to be set of n intersect set of m. So E0 will just be the singleton 0, E1 will just be the singleton 1, and those are distinct. Okay, So really, we just need to take two different uh, sets of realizers that, are, uh, that do not intersect. I forgot. Somehow my brain forgot what the word for that is. <laughs> Disjoint. I kept thinking distinct. 
I was stuck. Okay. And uh, interestingly, um, this sort of captures the difference between, well, in, in some way, which I don't really understand, but you know, so be it. This uh, difference um, captures the difference between the effective topos and the category of sets, the topos of sets. Now, you have a map from 2 to delta 2. So the problem we had here was defining maps out of delta 2, but there's no problem defining maps into delta 2. I can send um, 0 to 0 and 1 to 1. It's fine. And so we have a map this way. The only maps this way are all constant. However, if we start from the effective topos and take this map and localize at it, which is to say, like, formally add inverses to it, then our topos collapses to the topos of sets. So that's fun. All right. And one more thing. We've got a natural number object. So given the definition that you just saw here, this is going to be exactly what you would expect. The realizers for n equals m are just going to be the singleton n if n equals m, and otherwise it's g. So that's sort of hello to the effective topos. We've gotten to know it, and now we're going to look at some wider properties. I sort of forgot about the platform. OK. So. Oh, I guess I don't have a whole lot of time, do I? Uh, you have, um, let's see, another. I didn't half actually half? notice. Oh, okay. Oh, no, good. I didn't really notice when we started. I guess it was substantially after yeah, was when minutes. we might have started. <laughs> it was okay. 45 or something. All right. So we've got this. Delta, including sets in the effective topos. And we have actually I slipped it by you. I'm not going in the other direction. So global sections map, which takes x to the set of maps from 1 to x. So this is going to be. set of realizers for x equals x, such that x equals x as a realizer, modulo um, this equivalence relation, which says two things, oh, sorry, x, x, such that x is basically in x according to this per, where we identify things if there is a realizer in there. OK. And as it turns out, this is the junction. Surprise, surprise. Um, and gamma also preserves finite limits, which makes this a geometric morphism. We've talked about in the past. So we have a morphism of toposes. This is the direct image, this is the inverse image, and this goes from sets into F. And uh, sorry, okay. And actually, delta is even full and faithful, which makes this an inclusion of toposes. And uh, what this actually adds F to set. Uh, no, it's set to F. You're wrong. <laughs> you fool. <laughs> it's okay. I don't actually think you're a fool. <laughs> Apparently, it is surprising that sets is in F rather than F being in something else, which is usually you're working on um, some subpart of a topos. So, like, 
the thing on the right is the thing you understand and you look at a subtopos of it. But in this case, the thing we understand is set and we're looking at set inside something else. This is me sort of repeating things that I've heard but don't really understand. So you might you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, meanwhile. So the, so the reason why I thought something was weird is because normally delta is left adjoint to. Oh, OK. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly why this is unusual. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so speaking of oh, me right. repeating things that I don't really understand, this means that sets is J sheaves uh, on F for a topology J. And I believe this is like a Levere Tierney topology in that sense. Um, so sets, uh, objects and sets are somehow like sheaves with respect to some topology on F. And uh, what that topology is, so remember that one of our ways of thinking of a topology is a closure operator. It has some like function on truth values where here are truth values are sigmas. And uh, what this operator turns out to be is double negation. So this is sort of a recapitulation of the double negation translation where the world of classical logic is included in the world of constructive logic. So here, classical logic included in uh, constructive logic. And the, the sets are the double negation closed, so closed with respect to this closure operator, double negation closed objects. OK. Or, no, this is less important. We'll erase this. Um, yeah? So I have a question here. So uh, what's the interpretation with double negation? So uh, not x would be x implies bottom. This is an operator. This is a function from truth values to truth values. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So by extension, a function from formulas to formulas. Okay. Let me just erase all of this. OK, so we know that we've got sets living in our effective topos. Uh, what we also have are these things which are called separated objects. So here we're sort of thinking back to 2 and delta 2, where we saw that this, this problem that we had was like, well, OK, maybe I'll come back to that later. But say equals is I'm trying to think about this because I realize that I, I might not want to say this. Do 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 do. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we don't care about separated objects. <laughs> I was just uh, I was going from separated objects to something else, which is a subset of the separated objects. But my definition doesn't mention separated objects, so we may as well just skip it. Okay. So instead, effective objects, and I believe that another name for these are modest sets. Correct me. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. Okay. All right, so uh, these are definition spanning pages. So x equals is effective, and I think strictly effective is something you might also call this. First of all, x not empty. X. So this uh, I 
this um, partial equivalence relation is a actual equivalence relation. And if the x intersects the x prime, then x is actually equal to x prime. So we're uh, avoiding the problem that we had with delta 2. And finally, x equals x prime is the intersection of the x. So I think, I don't know what the force of that last one is, but anyway. So as it turns out, objects which are isomorphic to an effective object correspond basically to certain quotients of subobjects of the natural numbers object. So they're sort of subnumerable in a certain way. And uh, if you think about the delta 2 example, um, we sort of solved the problem that we had with delta 2 by giving different numbers to these different things and making sure that they didn't intersect. So if we want to be able to do that to some random set, uh, it can't be too big. Otherwise, you run out of numbers. So in that sense, subnumerable by n. Okay. And we'll see these come up in a second as sort of behaving in effective ways, let's say. OK. So now I come along to principles. So some non-classical principles, some maybe non-constructive principles. So first one is Markov's principle. So Markov's principle holds in the effective topos. And um, where the effective stuff comes in is if you want to prove Markov's principle in the effective topos, the way you do it is essentially you use the fact that Markov's principle holds in sets, okay? Um, which is fine, but if you wanted to sort of repeat this construction of the effective topos where you don't base it on sets, but you base it on some arbitrary topos, then you're gonna have some problems and you won't be able to prove Markov's principle in general. But you can prove Markov's principle for effective um, objects where Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> That's, uh, that doesn't make sense. So there's no effective object involved here. But it's uh, something of this flavor, so I, I didn't write down what it was. But um, there's a certain weaker formulation of Markov's principle that only that doesn't rely on Markov's principle holding in sense. You mean a generalization? Uh, uh, yeah, a generalization. I Markov's guess. principle is, I mean, that's one particular principle about numbers. and. Yeah. Numbers, right? So, so it's, it's maybe it's the double negated Markov's principle. No, it's some statement about like closed monics and like it's not like a, a logically phrased thing. So I was like, ah, oh, what's that? I'm not going to write that down. Um, but there are there are other examples of showing you that will have that explanation. Uh, yes, so something like that. So, so you, yeah, you may be right. <laughs> OK, I believe it. Okay. But uh, the better example is choice. So the axiom of choice from natural numbers into some set. So um, if you have sets mixed by natural numbers, holds in the effective topos. And you use axiom of choice for sets unless x is effective. And Dependent choice and x, same thing. Get it in the effective topos, and you only use dependent choice and sets if x is not an effective object. Okay. Also, Church's thesis. I forgot the exclamation. Okay. So, yeah, Church's thesis, um, which is to say that functions from n to n have indices. And this, again, there is a similar thing that holds if you replace n and n with arbitrary effective objects. And this 
is so if y is effective and if x is something that's almost effective that I didn't tell you about. But some parts of their requirements. So yeah. I missed this. So what is DC? DC? Um, oh, dependent choice. So you, you choose a natural number sequence of things and you use what you've chosen before to decide what to choose next, or decide how to choose next, rather. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Um, we don't have fan theorem. And I believe that that just follows from the fact that we do have Church's thesis. Uh, we do have what Highland calls Brower's theorem in quotes, and then in a footnote he says, this is more of a Brower's opinion or something like that. <laughs> uh, so this is all functions from R to R are continuous. So that holds any effective topos. Um, and actually also in Highland's paper, in the proof he writes, the reader will have to do this himself or else find, as I have failed to do, a readable account from the Russian school. <laughs> I like that <laughs> proof. Um, OK. So, so what do we mean by R? R? Is it oh, R? yeah. So you can, because dependent choice is true, um, you can, well, so you can do like the Cauchy sequence construction and the Dedekind construction. And because dependent choice is, is true, those turn out to be equivalent. So just like whatever construction of the reals you want will basically turn out to be the same. And um, sort of one of the motivations, at least for Highland, and he goes into it in the end of his paper, is to develop constructive real analysis. Um, but then you get sort of other interest in this thing for more topos theoretical reasons as well. OK. Mm -hmm. yeah, so some other things, synthetic domain theory, algebraic set theory, uh, non-standard arithmetic, other things that you might want to do. And now, pretty much done with things of substance to say, uh, since we have time. Um, I may as well say a few words on triposes. So you have a, a C tripos, tripos on a category C. And this is something sort of like a hyperdoctrine with a power object. So just to sort of um, say something, have uh, some, well, I guess that's, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really prepare to say anything about this is sort of like, if I have time for it, but so I'll just I'll just uh, say things and not try and write things down. Um, a hyperduction. I don't remember if we said what a hyperduction is, but um, so basically, this is something which represents uh, first order logic plus quantifiers, so first order predicate logic. I have again these for alls and exists as left and right address to substitution. So that's some requirement for axioms of, uh, of a hyperduction, and then. To get a tripos, you have this idea of where x is an object, you have um, pi of x sort of represent the power set of x, and then you have a relation uh, element of, which is a formula on x's and pi of x's, which says you know, whether x is in pi of x or not. OK. And then. The whole idea of this construction is you get sort of a, a topos from the tripos, which adds in these like partial equivalence relations on these things. And then if you want to. Sorry, EX or epsilon X is a mod? Uh, 
it's it's a um, so the the tripos is going to be the a you have uh, sets of formulas over objects. You have a hyperdoc hyper domain, so that means for every object you have a post set, uh, and you have a, you have a fun, sort of functorial institution with respect to morphisms in the base category. Right. Uh, and so this has to be. So an example of a hyperdoctrine is a subobject hyperdoctrine, where if you take the uh, subobjects of an object to be your post set. So this this p or sorry the pi is it is uh, it could an be an endo function of the base category. Uh, the, yes. Uh, no. Well. Yeah. No. Yeah. It actually it yeah it gives you yeah it gives you an object yeah that's right, and then uh, p and this is the the hyperdoctrine living over this product. Formulas. It could be formulas in these variables. Oh, yeah. P is the hyperdoctrine. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then e to x. Is so e to x is a is a formula something living over the variables formula in these variables. Oh, it's oh, it's. it's a okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, is that epsilon x epsilon? Yeah. <laughs> this is epsilon epsilon x is an element okay. of. <laughs> this oh, speaking of that okay. typo, um, also the I found the phi and the empty set is similar to each other. When you're you saying that, oh, this is an empty set, it's actually. I'm sorry. I hope you'll forgive me. Okay, and then the, the construction here is if you start with the PCA, partial combinatorial algebra, which is Basically, one way is you have one way to say this is you have elements k and x, uh, k and s, and I think we I think we covered this before, mm -hmm. um, but you have some set with some partial multiplication on that set. Which you think of as application, and then you have these two k and s combinators. This is uh, constant x, and this is some kind of composition thing. And this is enough to uh, let you write whatever lambda terms you like. And then your tripos that you get out of this is then our set of a something to the to the something this vector. So the formulas over some object x are going to be sets of elements of the partial combinatorial algebra, that is to say, sets of realizers. And then you go from this by a sort of introducing pairs, so on, to, the, to a realizability topos. Okay. So that's uh, everything I had to say and some other things also. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, do, are there other questions? Yeah. Effective topos. So realizability topos is just where you, um, you're you not starting with the set category, you're starting with something else? Uh, where you're not starting with the set of natural numbers. Oh, OK. I'm not sure. Yeah, you can. It's where you start with a, any given PC. Well, I but uh, um, but you mean like instead of sets as your like base topos that you put F as a sets inside of F. I, you can also do it where it's something other than sets, but I don't know if that's called a realizability topos. The definition that's in here is it's on sets. It's just a different PCA. But you know, for all I know, other people say other things. Did you look into assemblies as well? I did not. I read about them in there a while back, but I forgot what I read. OK, so let me encourage people. Uh, maybe I'll say something about it next week. It's another way of constructing the categorical way. OK? Yeah, I think that's probably what is done in here. I, uh, what is that? The 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 yeah. 
you want to see it. Have to. I can't just like hand it over to you. Okay, well, let's take a five minute break uh, and then we'll uh, watch it. Today is one of the days I have to do the um, pieces. Oh yeah. Uh, also, uh, Ray or email. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So they look like some good resources there. Um, uh, the you have to read all of. The yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I was kind of just going to see how far I get, and you know, yeah. fill an hour with stuff like. Um, Try to browse and see if there's something interesting. There's, anything. There's also another paper. Uh, the type is very similar to Pear's article on the path from uh, involving human physics. Thurman also has an article like that. It's a precursor to his book, maybe a shorter version of his book. Uh, uh, by by book, you mean? The uh, uh, logic of metaphysics. Okay. The or logical, logical basis, basis of metaphysics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and then as far as the connection of the um, paradoxes, so the I, I sort of I'd gotten that out of the George and Bellman textbook, and then they cite this certain passage in um, in Dummett's book uh, okay. Frege of Philosophy of Math, yeah, um, yeah. and um, but the but the they might overstate it, or at least, I mean, if that's the only thing that he ever wrote about it, then they probably overstated a little bit, but. Um, uh, I certainly haven't read every page of them either, so you can have a look and see what you find. We'll be very interested to see what you find. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to work out well what his. Yeah, so there about. is this very. I mean, it would be good to lay out the argument for um, what would it have to, what would it take to for us to give a realist, a realist account of mathematics, uh, or can there be, can we carve out when uh, on his account you should. Except low excluded middle uh, for domain, and then you can try to see what would be the argument, say, for having a wider extent than the basic intuitionist or constructivist thing. Maybe is there so like I mean, you're saying like what Dummett would be, uh, feel would need to be the that's be right. argued yeah. for to, and, yeah. and could you make such a case, say, for Saul's uh, semi-intuitionist accept theory? That you could make a case that uh, you can accept excluded middle for any arithmetical formula, for instance, but not a set theoretical formula in general. Um, yeah, so I guess there was the stuff about like a meaning theory and the so like this right, kind yeah. of three layers of justifications or yeah. something. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I'm not. Uh, too sure exactly what the right like approach is for Dummy because there's like there's some part of it which is about this realism, anti-realism stuff, which is kind of meta, and then there's um, well, I guess the um, the meaning theory stuff is sort of part of that, and then and then there's the specific issue of the juncture of poverty is realism, anti-realism, mathematics. The um, the one that is kind of seems more reasonable. He, he, to has, he seems to have a very um, coherent, um, um, like uh, bibliography. <laughs> like all, all, he seems to have this one perspective that he's really like worked out or whatever. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's right. So that makes it easy. You don't have to disjoint. Uh, yeah, um, so the say, okay, is, you know, the seventies did this, and the nineties did that. And like, so oh, they need to here's this basic approach, uh, and you can also criticize it. It's very distinct from what Quine was able to do, right? Uh, his philosophy of language that underpins the, the, the you logical have to basis of physics. Right? Yeah. You you need a yeah, yeah, yeah sure, stick, sure. Otherwise, uh, it's account kind of with meaning theory. I'm not I'm not sure. In order to make sense of it, right? You could oh, and, oh, and, and an attack on him. His position would be. Why oh, attack, so say, love yeah, here, uh, all the content we can understand, we understand um, the language, from from the the thing, and it's not the case that we need to uh, 
to give this account of how you understand various atoms in language. Well, we can talk about projects of others or how to do that meaning is use explanation. Okay. On the other hand, he can also import part of the Quanian picture and say, I don't know what, uh, well, yeah, the first little long argument, but if, if you're interested in that connection, that's also something to Yeah, well, I, mean, I feel like I don't know enough about if the um, clients like holism to, to like make that. Maybe it's something that um, many people have studied. So, uh, it can, uh, maybe you had had a course in philosophy of language. I mean, we we broached in the um, course seminar last uh, year, but uh, like I think that. That might be too far, I think. Uh, for the but, yeah, can I give you something you're familiar with? Very uh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, anyways, I'll yeah. get going on it. And okay. Um, you can write yeah, me again. If you help or help or talk to her. So, uh, in the end, uh, there's a not really a function, but there's an effective. Uh, uh, that uh, what I'm talking about is that equality is interpreted as the uh, important set where each, where each one has a different realizer. So, it's from the function of the finance so that, uh, so what's the, the function of it? Uh, yeah, the finance is you, you get in the case of co products because you have the finance of co products. Okay. So there will be a function. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 So, I'm going to be doing uh, some more chiefy things. Okay, so, synthetic differential geometry. All right, so I'm just, just going to give a just very brief little outline of the talk. Um, we're going to start stating, which is called the Coquilvaire axiom, um, which says that in some sense all functions on the geometric line are smooth. So this should obviously be very reminiscent of Brouwer's theorem. We're going to see why this is incompatible with the law of the excluded middle. And then of course one says, well, this is a nice axiom, but just do you have any models? And so we're actually going to do just next a bit of algebraic geometry because it, I think it's going to be very important in motivating the discussion of these models. Then uh, it's called the category of loci, which is important in constructing these things, and finish with my favorite uh, my favorite model, which is sheaves on the site of so-called C infinity schemes. All right. 
So, oh, and one remark, when I say ring, what I mean is I'm trivial ring with identity. So, and when I say manifold, it's for the whole rest of the talk. What I mean to say is smooth manifold with the countable base. So what is, so we just want to start, let's just think of this as the geometric line, which is a ring, R, and denote by D, uh, the subring of nil squares. Okay. So you think of this like some kind of infinitesimal. It's so small its square is zero. So what does the Kolkovair axiom say? Hey, I probably want to move between both boards. Um, for all functions g from b to r, there is a unique element d such that g of d equals g of 0 plus db. D. Okay. So, in particular, if we have g of d as some function f of x plus d, then we have f of x plus d equals f of x plus some d that's contingent on x d. And I'm going to write that very suggestively as f prime of x. So all functions r to r are smooth. Okay. So can go over here? Yeah. Um, so why is this incompatible with the uh, log square middle? So we consider this function. It's going to be zero with x equals zero, one. Otherwise, so by the Kolkovair axiom, f of d is f prime of zero d. So some type of red flag. We're going to say d is zero or d is not equal to zero. So here's obviously. So assume. So if we suppose d is not zero, then f prime of zero d equals one, multiplying by both sides, or d on both sides. Um, you get that d is zero, so that's a contradiction. So our only nil squares are zero, but we require our beyond trivial, and this is going to contradict the uh, the uniqueness part of the Kolkovair axiom because anything multiplied by zero is zero. Okay, and a second proposition okay. is that we do have some non-zero nil squares. So we just suppose don't identify any function dr. That would, that would be g of zero plus d d. This is derivative. D is all zero. Again, this contradicts uniqueness. Okay. So we have some. It's kind of spooky. And um, you, so, you know, you usually want to think of the geometric line as being some kind of field. That's and a so, question. Hmm? Uh, I think it's curious because in the, in the final line, uh, you only have to consider all of the in the capital T, right? Yes. And you're assuming that uh, the only thing in capital D is zero. So, yes. why would you have non zero D in, the, in that line? Hmm? Would you suppose? Mean, yeah, I'm supposing that. So yeah, I'm saying for all zero. So I'm supposing that g of d equals g of zero, right? For all d. Um, but the, it's it's the unique. You're saying there exists a unique b such that that happens, right? And oh. If you multiply anything by zero, I mean, there's so there's non, the ring's non-trivial. There's more than one element in it, right? Yeah. Oh. So, 
Yeah, it's, it contradicts the uniqueness of the derivative. Yeah, okay. Um, so normally when I think of the geometric line as being some kind of field, and so this part, I don't know, it's, just, it's kind of cool. Um, this came from my, uh, some notes from Mike Shulman's pizza seminar on this subject, whatever that means. <laughs> but uh, you want to think of R as being, you know, some kind of field, but it has nil potent elements. So, you know, when you say something is a field, you're saying if something's not zero, it's invertible. So I'm saying X is not equal to zero implies X invertible. And if you contrapose this, if you have X is not invertible, you just have this, so this is slightly weaker condition. So the not so the infinitesimals are kind of really floating between this zero and non-zero category. I just thought this was kind of cool. Um, okay, so what? So you're doing this last statement mm -hmm. during the geometric plane? Um, so I'm going to say exactly. You can you you can cancel these things as long as they are. This is just this kind of motivational. You can cancel these things as long as they're universally quantified. So um, if AD equals BD for all D and D, right? Then if I define F of D as AD, BD, right? I can write F of D as F of zero, well F of zero. So that's zero as uh, its derivative. So I'll just call this derivative C, D, right? And that's the same thing as A, D, that's the same thing as B, D, and so by uniqueness, A equals B equals C. So you can cancel them when they're universally quantified. So, yeah. So that's the deal with cancellation. Um, there are some. There's some other kind of infinitesimal objects that are useful. Um, you know, you have, you have the product of these. Um, D sub K is the set of all X and R such that X to K plus one is zero. Um, D of N, you think of that as um, all these N tuples such that the product of any two of their entries is zero. And you have some kind of canonical mappings between these things. Um, so equal I, you say maps D to DN, and it takes this thing and, so this is the i spot. Okay. And what else? Delta D to DK. And it's one of the kind of things like this, I write, write an inkle, say 2, 3, which maps D of 2 to D of 3, and say I take, I call this delta epsilon to delta epsilon 0. Okay? And, all right, so I think I'm going to move back to this board. <laughs> okay, so, right, so before we talk about models, I have to talk about a little bit of algebraic geometry in particular because I want to talk about C infinity schemes. Um, so. Um, okay, so definition. So R is a ring, and like I said, by ring I mean commutative ring with identity. And spec R, called the spectrum, is all prime ideals. So all prime ideals of the ring. Okay, and I want to think of a prime ideal as being a point somehow and being contained in a prime ideal. So I think of, I'll give, I'll give an example. So if I write, say, spec Z, I want to think of the prime ideals as points. Right. So all these prime ideals plus this extra kind of mysterious point that I'm not going to talk about. And so two is a function on this thing. And it takes 2 mod 2, 2 mod 3, 2 mod, two mod 5, 2 mod 7. Um, and so you want to think of an element being contained in a prime ideal as vanishing at that point. So, for example, uh, one people think about a lot is a spectrum of polynomials with complex coefficients. And the maximum ide uh, prime ideals 
it's an axle too, but primary yields look like something like this, where this is complex. And so you have all the points corresponding to all of these numbers, and you call that the affine line plus this extra point. Um, and so you have affine planes and other kind of things like that. And in particular, there's, I want to say next, um, yeah, so if you have A as a ring, and I is an ideal, then prime ideals of A mod I are in bijection with prime ideals of A containing I. So this is we draw for this barbells. This is, this is very easy to prove. I'm not going to go through the time. <laughs> um, and so, so you think, for example, if I take the spectrum of com uh, bivariate complex coefficient polynomials and mod out by x squared plus y squared minus one, I want to think of this as cutting out a circle in the affine plane. So this is like a circle, right? Because these points are the ones that where this vanishes by this kind of way we're thinking about them. Um, and so you do some other things with these. You endow them with the topology, which I'm I'm not going to describe because I'm just trying to give a feel for some of the stuff, which is called the Zariski topology. And you also endow this with a, with a sheaf of rings. Um, okay. And so. Let me see. So what else is important to say about these things? Ah, could, yeah. Could you say briefly what, what you mean by a sheaf of rings? Oh, okay. So we talked about sheaves last time. Right. So you have a topology on this thing. Do you want me to say what the sheaf is? Yeah, because okay. last time okay. it was sufficiently abstract. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Fine, fine, fine. I'll do that. So, okay. Um, so, you give the topology by giving the base. So if A is my ring, and I have an element of this ring, I have this set that I call uh, distinguished open, and I want this to be all of the points where F does not vanish, all the primordials not containing F. Okay? And so all these sets with, uh, so these sets for elements of this ring form the base of the Zarechi topology. All right, and so you can put, you can specify a sheaf by specifying it on a base because you can glue functions in a unique way. And so I just specify the sheaf on the base. It's just this, I, I, the, the section over this. So, um, so call this, uh, I don't know what you want to call it. This, I suppose. Is being uh, is uh, the ring lo the localization of the ring by AF? I mean you are inverting all powers of F, and so that's the section of the sheaf over the distinguished open. And so you glue them for larger open sets. So, so you have a sheaf, and you have a bunch of rings over it, and you can you glue sets. You have a larger ring, and you can restrict the restrictions of ring homomorphisms. Okay, so then if you have a homomorphism of rings A to B, you can easily show that prime ideals here pull back to prime ideals here. So that allows us to think of spec as a contravariant functor. Um, so right now I'm saying spec as being a contravariant functor, well, I guess top because I told you what topology is. I haven't told you what morphisms of schemes are yet, so I don't want to say this is contravariant to affine schemes, but but it is. I'll say what the morphisms are, <laughs> okay? Um, okay, so what is a scheme in general is what you call a ring space, so topological space together with a sheaf of rings, um, such that there exists an open cover uh, 
of this topological space um, such that for all uh, these UIs, there's some AI such that um, yes, yeah, such that this topological space sorry, <laughs> such that this topological space, yes, is isomorphic to the spectrum of this ring. And so you With use the restriction of OX to UI. Yes, 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 yes. Restriction, so it's X, OX, restricted to UI, so you restrict the sheath. And this is isomorphic to spec AI plus its structure sheaf. Yes. And so you say um, that something, that if you have a ring space and it's isomorphic to something like this, just for some fixed ring, you call that an affine scheme. So schemes are things that are locally affine. Okay, so that's a scheme. And there's another thing you say a space is locally ringed. So a ring space is a locally ringed space if for all points in this topological space the stalk of the structure sheet at P is a local ring, which means it has a unique maximal ideal. What um what time is it? How much time do I have that way? So you have another 45 minutes? Okay, wonderful. Okay, so that's a locally ring space. Um and we want to think of functions on a scheme, you, know, you can think of modding out by a maximal ideal as evaluating a function at a point. And so the field that functions take values in, so it's, I guess it's kind of strange, varies from point to point around the scheme because the function takes values in, in the residue fields at each point, right? So if I wanted to find a morphism of schemes. So first, I'll define a morphism of ring spaces. So, if these x and o x are ring spaces, and a morphism of ring spaces. My handwriting is horrible. Um, a morphism of ring spaces is. The data of two maps, call F, F sharp, okay, and F is a continuous map of topological spaces, and F sharp is a morphism of sheaves, so natural transformation, morphism of sheaves, from the structure sheaf on Y to F lower star of the structure sheaf on F. And did we did we define F lower star last week? I don't know. It's the, okay. Oh, yeah, it's the it's the pusher. So if if I have um, a sheaf on X and I have a continuous map F X to Y, I define F star of X. Right. If you look at each of its sections, that's uh, F. So U is an open set of Y, F inverse of U. So you kind of like cheat and get a sheaf on Y from your sheaf on X. So right, you need to do this, otherwise you're like comparing apples and oranges. So that's a morphism of ring spaces. Okay. All right. So, I suppose we would like to say that a morphism of schemes is a morphism of ring spaces, but um, I mean, what, what you want to say is something that, like, if you have an F in this section, then the values of F sort of agree with 
should, should agree with these values, but I mean, you don't, um, the, the function takes values in different residue fields at each point. So you want to say that the morphism preserves the maximal ideal. So, so, so that you can have the functions that vanish at a point pull back to, to functions vanishing at the, the pull back point. So, um, so definition. If I have x and L of x, y, L, y, these are ring spaces. Okay. A morphism of locally ring spaces. <laughs> so the locally ring. The local ring. Hmm? Yes, 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 local ring. And I forgot to say, yes. Correct. I forgot to say schemes. <laughs> schemes are locally ring spaces. Um, morphism of locally ring spaces is a morphism of ring spaces um, at, at sharp. Um, that preserves the maximal ideal in the sense that for each point the so this would be the induced map on stocks sends the maximal ideal here to the maximal ideal here. Okay. Um, so now we have morphisms and we have a category of schemes. And so this theorem is I guess I'll go to this board now. Um, so this theorem is important. So now that we have a category of schemes, we have a category of affine schemes. And I claim that the category, so those rings, so commutative rings with identity, is equivalent to the dual of the category of affine schemes. To it's equivalent to AFSCO. Okay? And when I say what the functors are that induce this equivalence, it's like very clear that the things are equivalent. So um, we have one way the spectrum, the spec functor, which we already talked about, and this goes from rings. To half stop. And then the next one, so the other side, we have this, and we call it the global sections functor. And what does it do? It takes an affine scheme, so spec A, O spec A, which I don't think I said, but I should have said, denotes the structure sheaf, um, to the global section. Okay. And it takes a morphism of affine schemes to the component of this natural, the, the global component of the natural transformation, I guess you would say. So F sharp sub spec B. And of course, well, I, I should say, I don't have time to prove it, but it's good to know. Um, this, you, you can specify also a morphism of, uh, this has, a, has an adjoint, and so you could specify it equally something called F sharp of F inverse O Y to O X, and this is the, the left adjoint of the thing. So you could, you, could, you could do it either way, but I think this is easier to work with because the construction of this is some arcane co-limit and, okay. Um, but uh, wait a minute. So yeah. the um, the structure sheaf mm -hmm. and uh, spec A. Spec A itself is a distinguished open, right? It's the distinguished open corresponding to the unit of the ring, right? Mm -hmm. Are you going to tell us that? Well, uh, what, I'm sorry. What did you say? Well, you're going to show us that this is an equivalence, right? Yes. And but you, we we already know what O spec A at a distinguished open is. Yes. And it's spec oh, A. Oh, what is this thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, you're right. You're right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is just um, the ring itself. Exactly, because yeah. spec A itself is D of one. Yes. And A with, you know. Yeah, you're just in, you're just in. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I should have said this. I'm sorry. I'm a little. Yes, you're just you're just inverting one here, and so, so you just get the ring itself. Yeah. yeah. So it, so this is this is why you're taking the global section of the spec of it. It's, right. So it's, this is this is clearly an equivalence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that was that was very important. I should have said this. Okay. So, great. So now we can now we can get back to what we actually cared about in the beginning. So. Okay. So the category, the so-called category of loci. Okay. All right. Is this, is this marker good? Is, can, this, can this be seen well? I don't, no, not not really? Good. No. Okay. Do you want to switch to the blackboard? Yeah, let's switch. Okay, I'll switch to the blackboard and I will not switch back to this board because it's like the marker is off. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, what's going to happen? Talk about category of loci. Um, so the this, this story is very similar here. So with algebraic geometry, we had an algebraic object, which was a ring. And that was your algebraic object. And it corresponded to a geometric object, which is a skinny ring. Oh, thank you. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll just stay on this board. <laughs> so yeah, and so it, cor uh, it corresponded to a geometric, a geometric object in particular, the dual of the category. So when you took the dual, the algebraic thing, you got the geometric thing, which was an affine scheme. And here we're going to have something that plays. What what is plays the same role? We have an algebraic object called a C infinity ring, and that's going to take on the role of like commutative rings with identity and its dual are going to be the so-called loci. So this paradigm is the same. Okay. So what is a C infinity ring? So I'm going to give two different definitions of the C infinity rings because I don't know every paper I read on them gives two different definitions of them. So I figured I might as well. <laughs> um, so the first definition of a C infinity ring. Sorry, I have a basic question. Yes, sorry. Um, the distinction between duality and equivalence. Mm -hmm. So duality is a special type of equivalence. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you when you prove the equivalence over here, you actually prove it was dual. Yeah, because it involved an op. That's all. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So. Um, yes. Yeah, so C infinity ring is a set. C together with so for each n greater than or equal to zero and each map R n to R a smooth map like this. Um, we have an operation of so the interpretation of that map, which we map. Cn to C. So, so two things hold. One, if we have F sub i's, which are smooth app maps R and R, I going from one to some M, and then we have a smooth map G from R M to M, uh, R M to R, and we define some H from R N to R by h of x1, xn equals g of f1 and all the way to fm of x1 up to xn, then the interpretation of these will preserve that. So phi sub h of c1 up to cn will equal phi sub g of phi sub f1 of c1 to Cn all the way up to phi sub Fm of C1 up to Cn. And moreover, 
it preserves projections. So phi sub pi j of C1 up to Cn equals Cj, where pi j denotes the canonical projection. So that's the infinity ring. Okay. And a morphism of C infinity rings. So if I have C and D, which are C infinity rings, a morphism of C infinity rings, phi C to D, is a map such that um, for all smooth functions, R and R, the, this diagram commutes. So the map, call this phi sub star and phi f. right here. Okay, so what um, phi f is the interpretation of f by this c infinity ring, psi f is the interpretation by this c infinity ring, and what I'm saying here is um, is by phi star under n, I'm, I'm saying that you're taking um, say phi of c and up to phi of c, and that's what I that's what I mean by this operation. You're putting it under in each, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Now I'm going to be kind of fast. I'm going to give a much better definition soon. Yeah. Are you setting us some examples as well? Yes. 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 I will give an example. Okay. Okay, so you guys should just do an example over here. So I'm just, I mean, this is this is really the canonical example that's like really the one to have in mind. So if X is a, is a manifold, okay, then by C infinity of X, I mean all smooth maps X to R, okay? And if I have an n greater than zero and an f from Rn to R, then I want to define phi sub f from c infinity of x n to c infinity of x by phi sub f of c1 cn of x is going to equal, can I squeeze this in here? f of c1 of x up to cn. So these are all functions from, so x is a point of the manifold, right? So these are all functions from the manifold r. And so this is an rn, and f evaluates it, and this is an r, okay, because this, okay. Yeah, so that's how you want to interpret these things. And moreover, if you have a smooth map of manifolds, f from x to y, then the pullback will give you a map from C infinity of Y to C infinity of X from, you just precompose with F and that's a homomorphism of C infinity rings. Morphism, C infinity ring, homomorphism, I'm saying, because we're thinking of these as rings, I'm saying morphism and homomorphism. Okay, so we can give a much more succinct definition of these things. So, definition I denote by uke the category of Euclidean spaces, Rn for n, uh, 
So there's the objects and smooth maps between them are the morphisms. Okay, and then I say a C infinity ring is just a finite product preserving. Why am I underlining that? I find a product preserving, uh, it's a, it's a co-free sheet. So a functor from u to sex. Okay, and so then a, morph a C infinity ring homomorphism is just a natural transformation of functors. So how does this square with our previous definition of C infinity ring? Well, so why do we call them both C infinity rings or the same thing? So if I define, I say C is my interpretation of R, right? And I have some n greater than zero, some smooth R n to R. Um, so since f preserves products, right, f of f of r, f of rn to f of r, that is a map from c n to c, and I define my phi f to be phi of f, and by, by functoriality, it'll preserve all the, all the things we wanted it to preserve. Um, and I, so I can write, so for this example, I can write C infinity of X as just on X. So I, it's much cleaner. <laughs> All right. And, oh, I should say one kind of, just kind of interesting side note about these things. Um, so, sorry. Yes. Uh, so in the in the canonical example, in the stick of number, <coughs> what's mm -hmm. the n i c before f? I still decode it. What did I write? I'm sorry. Oh, n greater than equal to zero. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. N greater. Than, I have very bad handwriting. So that's supposed <laughs> that's supposed to be n greater than equal to zero. Yeah. 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 Um, so one other thing. So some people. So just a kind of whatever remark. So some people call C infinity rings, also they go by the name of smooth algebras. And so I thought this was kind of funny. One of the major reasons is people are afraid that we're going to soon start talking about these. <laughs> so uh, oh, no. so that's, that's the fear, is that we should start calling them smooth algebras before it's too late. <laughs> okay. Um, so we want to give this... What, what time am I, am I? Um, so we have another 15, oh, 24, okay. 25 minutes, yeah, 25. Okay, okay, great, 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 good. <laughs> so we want to give, we want to give these the structure, because I haven't even defined loci. Um, <laughs> we want to give these things the, the structure of a commutative R algebra. Okay, so how are we going to define addition? That's going to be as phi sub f of C1, C, uh, CC prime, where by f, I mean addition. And multiplication, I'm going to define like this. Interpretation of multiplication. Um, so scaling, right? So lambda C, I want to be phi sub lambda prime of C, whereby lambda prime, I mean lambda prime of x is lambda of x, so that's a scalar. Um, zero, I want to define as phi, so zero prime of the empty set, and one, I want to be phi, one prime of the empty set, whereby zero prime, I mean, I take, it's a map from r naught to r, that maps the empty set to zero, 
time is not the empty set to one. And so this gives you the structure of an R algebra. And by an ideal of a C infinity ring, I mean an ideal with the C infinity ring regarded as an R algebra. Okay? So is this okay? Maybe I'll erase the, this example. So, and I want to be able to give quotients the structure of a C infinity ring as well. So, for example, if I have this is a C. <laughs> is a C infinity ring, and I is an ideal in C, and that's, again, as regarded as an R algebra in this way, then I want to give the structure of a C infinity ring how I want uh, to define phi sub f super to the i as just phi f of C1 up to Cn plus I. And one can easily check this as well defined. Um, all right, so another definition. Okay. So, so I have a C infinity ring C, and I say C is finitely generated. If there exists, um, if there exists, what am I saying? If there exists C1 up to Cn, the generators, uh, such that for all C, little c within C, there exists a smooth there exists a smooth F Rn to R such that um, C is F of C1 up to Cn. So it's, it's in this sense that they generate the C infinity ring, that all elements can be expressed in this fashion. Okay. And one more definition. A C infinity ring C is called local if regarded as an R algebra. It is local, and moreover. The quotient by the maximal ideal is isomorphic to R. So we have that extra condition. And um, this, when we do, if we have time, a uh, C infinite scheme, this will be nice because all local rings have the same residue field, and so all morphisms are local morphisms, and you don't have to worry about the thing you did with, uh, with the regular Hausberg geometry. I don't want to say classical because that's a different kind of thing that people don't really do anymore. Um, okay, so now we can define the category of loci. And it's just going to be the formal dual. So I write L to be the dual of the category of finitely generated C infinity rings. The idea is, of course, that just as in algebraic geometry, the dual of our algebraic object will be some kind of geometric thing. Um, okay, so, so I have another definition here. Probably should have said it before. But a Vey algebra, W, is a local ring, um, a local ring with maximal ideal uh, M such that the quotient by the maximal ideal is isomorphic to R and M to the N is zero for some. So they're all no quotient. 
works on that. And the kind of canonical example to keep in mind of a Vey algebra is the so-called ring of dual numbers uh, used all the time in algebraic geometry. So this is x is no potent in here, and so the, the maximal ideal here is x, and it's just by the lattice isomorphism theorem. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so what do I want to say here? Ah, so I'm going to write suggestively. Um, oh, and to distinguish elements, uh, C, finally generated C infinity rings from their dual, I'm go going to write L. So if A is a finally generated C infinity ring, I want to write LA, keeping with the notation from the book models for smooth infinitesimal analysis. I um, saw somebody use spec ones, I think, but I don't know. This is what we're using. Oh, so I'm using this. Um, I'm going to write D as L of C infinity R mod X squared. Okay? And so I'm just going to state a couple things. And you write, oh yeah, and you could write, you know, we also write D to the K as L of C infinity of R mod X to the K plus one. Okay. And I'm just going to state a couple theorems now. Um, the proofs are kind of involved, but they can all be found in the book um, models of smooth infinite decimal analysis, and that's by. So I don't. How do you how do you pronounce his name? Mordike. Mordike. Okay, Mordike and. I guess you pronounce that Ryes or Ryes? Ryes? Okay, Ryes. Mordick and Ryes. Okay, so these these guys in chapters uh, two and three of their book, this book, all the proofs of what is to follow. Um, so proposition. So I have a functor from the category of manifolds to L by M maps to the locus of the C infinity out, uh, C infinity ring corresponding to M, and that's full and faithful. Um, another proposition: all loci of way of uh, Vey algebras are exponentiable. This one's kind of this one's kind of cool. Um, so, so for some manifold S of M to the D is the same thing as S of the total space of the tangent bundle of the <laughs> manifold. And so this is kind of interesting. Um, so in Anders Koch's book, um, which is just called Synthetic Differential Geometry. Uh, most of the book is kind of given in the naive style, and the the models and the top, uh, topos is coming like at the very end. Finds a tangent vector to be a path from D to M, uh, a, a map from D to M, and it's kind of interesting because in classical differential geometry, so this is like an infinitesimal path. There is a notion uh, there where people they sometimes they define tangent vectors by equivalence classes of of very small paths, and so you can do that. And so the tangent bundle you think of as being these, and so a vector. So it gives kind of this interesting way to think of vector fields. I know I'm kind of going off silo, but I think this is very really interesting. Um, so what is a vector field? A vector field is uh, a section of the tangent bundle. So. This is my vector field, I'm about that side hat, and this is the natural projection to the base space, this diagram means. So a vector field is a section of the tangent bundle, and if this is really an exponential, I have my adjunction, and I can write this 
as a different map m across d to m, and so that you can see this as an infinitesimal deformation of the manifold, and you can do it one more time, check, and you get d maps m to m. So then you can see a vector field as a tangent vector of the manifold of all self maps to the manifold whose base point is the identity map. So I think that's perfect. Um, all right. Okay, so this is all nice, but we want a little bit further. We, we want to model this thing. So um, the theorem, and this is in model smooth infinitesimal analysis, is that pre-sheaves on the category of loci is a well-adapted, meaning there's a full faithful functor from the category of manifolds into it is a well-adapted model of synthetic differential geometry, meaning it satisfies the focal bear axiom. All right, and in, there's this there's this whole zoology of different models that they give that I don't remember a lot of them. There's one in particular that they spend a good portion on of uh, sheaves of so-called um, the category so-called germ-determined. Um, Germ determines the infinity rings, and I wish I could remember the definition. <laughs> well, so you take um, an ideal on one of these the canonical ones, or mm -hmm. an, an, an S of R M. Mm -hmm. and you take a germ determined ideal. Mm -hmm. So it's a, whether a function is in the ideal or not is determined only by its the germ. By the germ. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that, that kind of makes sense because if you change, uh, if you modify by something and then but you think of the thing you take the zero things, mm -hmm. and if you change it by you know outside of that, right, right, you right. really change the thing. So sure, that makes sense. Yeah, 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 yes. And um, endowed with the choice of growth and topology, it's a fully well adapted model. Meaning, you take you can take open covers to covering families, and that's like particularly nice. Okay, so next, see infinity schemes. So. C infinity schemes. So this is what I'm going to say here is based off of a paper um, called what exactly is the name of this paper? It's called Algebraic Geometry over C infinity rings, uh, C infinity schemes. Oh, C infinity rings. <laughs> so, yes, I had to read it. All right, so Algebraic Geometry over C infinity rings, and that's by Dominic. Choice. So, um, I what happened was uh, Dubuc in nineteen eighty one in his paper that was just called C Infinity Schemes proved that the category of these things is a, a well adapted site, a fully well adapted site, meaning the topos of sheaves on this category is a fully well adapted model of synthetic differential geometry. Um, so he did it just as a model of um, synthetic differential geometry, but it's it's gone a little past that, and so a lot of this paper is devoted to it's not synthetic differential geometry, but what what he calls C infinity stacks and Delenia Mumford C infinity stacks. I, I don't I'm I'm trying currently trying to understand those, so I don't really know, but but um, but if you're interested in this, this is a really great paper. Um, okay, so what is the C infinity scheme? Okay. So a C infinity ring space is a topological space. Space X together with a sheaf of C infinity rings. A sheaf of C infinity rings. Okay. 
Okay. And a locally C infinity ring <coughs> space is a pretty much the same thing if it's a locally ring space is a C infinity ring space such that all points are the topological space, the stock of the structure sheet at that point is a local uh, is a local C infinity ring. Okay? And we remark that um, so if I have uh, local C infinity rings, uh, again, if you quotient by the maximum ideal, they're both isomorphic to R. So you don't have the problem you had with schemes. And so all morphisms of C infinity locally ringed, locally C infinity ring spaces are all, all morphisms of locally C infinity ring spaces are local. Yes. So what is a morphism of these things? So if, oh, I'm sorry, I'm confusing. I need to define what these things are first. So we have something called the global sections functor. Gamma from local C infinity rings to the dual of the category of C infinity rings. And uh, a right adjoint that we call spec um, I should say what this is. <laughs> um, this takes it's it's the same thing as the old global sections functor. And Um, so this is what the global sections functor does. It has a right adjoint that we call the spec functor. And so an affine C infinity scheme an affine C infinity scheme. X, OX is isomorphic in the category of local C infinity rings to spec C or some C infinity ring C and or over a C infinity scheme X O X is a local C infinity ringed space that can be covered by open sets UI. such that for each i u with the structure sheet restricted to u is a c infinity affine scheme. So isomorphic to something of the form spec c where c is a c infinity ring and this is the right adjoint of the global sections functor. Am I do I have any time left? A couple minutes. A couple minutes? Yeah. Um, what are they good for? What are these good for? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> the the big thing was that uh, they, the, the category of C infinity rings is a uh, well-adapted site. So you endow it with some particular growth and topology. And sheaves on that site are a well-adapted model of synthetic differential geometry. 
Um, outside of that, I'm actually not quite sure. I have not gotten through a ton of the paper, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I, I suppose I could, uh, in a few couple minutes, I could define um, mod. I could define modules over them, or I could take questions. I don't know. Oh, this that's... would be better. Maybe questions. So yeah, it's like question. Okay. So let's thank you for. <laughs> So uh, in these C infinity schemes, you, you have a you have these uh, things that have no potent elements as well, right? Uh, you still have a, like a, Bay algebras. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. so that's something they they remember, and maybe the intersection theory is nice. That's something that's often a little annoying. Uh, that um, that somehow is solved in class. I mean, Grove big style algebraic geometry. You have a you have a very nice way of keeping track of um, multiplicity of intersections because you can count. Um, say, if you take um, how many times does the uh, the curve y equals x squared uh, intersect the, the the line y equals zero? Well, has a double intersection point. That's somehow remembered in the quotient scheme. Right. And I can imagine that, that a bit similar benefit would prove here, and that might make, make some geometric arguments um, nicer. Maybe there's a kind of um, maybe there's some nicer forms of intersection theory in this framework. Mm. I, I'm, I'm not quite. I mean, I'm not quite sure. Okay, so why were you yeah. interested in the infinity schemes? Oh, I well. So oh, why was I interested in them? Yeah. Oh, I, I just I just thought it was this kind of fascinating thing where you kind of just just as a kind of aesthetic thing where you have algebraic geometry and you have differential geometry and these are very disparate, different subjects and you usually don't apply techniques of one to the other. And so you construct a C infinity. You basically just you, you grab a copy of Hartshorn and you replace the word ring with C infinity ring everywhere, and that's how you construct these things. But she's on that site. You have things like differential forms. You have Stokes's theorem and synthetic differential geometry. So uh, I, I I just thought that was fascinating. That was that was really why I was just interested in these things. Yeah. All right. Let's call it a day.